Hello, everybody. I have some sad news. I wasn't able to make the taping for this recording. Just so you guys know, uh, it's been a very, very busy month for me personally. I've had some personal stuff in my life happening. I have to move again. Um, tax season is also upon me as a new business owner. So, Marshall, I'm very sorry. My schedule has just been a total disaster this month, but I promise I will be back um, in January. And we should explore, actually. You know, maybe bring somebody else in order to fill in for me or for you when either of us can't make it. So, since both of us have such busy lives right now. Yeah. And as everyone knows, we're in the process of scaling the show. And when we do not publish, the numbers just collapse yeah, it's way worse. across right. weeks. So like podcasting, people like it when we give the background here with podcasting, consistency is key. So we mm -hmm. think it's just best to keep publishing in December, even if we both can't make it. But something we want to do next year when we're more organized is bring in a guest host when either I can't make it or Sagar can't make it. So definitely write in for people who you think would be great fits. Immediately, we thought of someone like Alex Kantoritz, who's a good friend of the show. But it'd be good to see suggestions for who people should fill in with, like I do for Crystal and Sager, Kyle Kalinske does the same, yep. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On to this actual episode. I knew if we had to do a single booking, I'd do one that everyone would love. It's with Matt Ridley. Um, he is the co-author with Alina Chan of Viral, the Search for the Origin of COVID-19. We know people enjoy COVID origin stories. And what's really interesting about this book is... Matt Ridley is a member of the House of Lords. He actually recorded this episode from a closet in Parliament in the UK. So this isn't just some random YouTuber who it's no not one a has boomer ever heard of yeah. <laughs> talking about things. Like it's an actual serious, honestly, he says this card carrying member of the establishment who really pursued this interesting decentralized investigation into the origins of COVID. We go through where everyone agrees, where everyone disagrees, what he thinks is happening. And the thing that's interesting for me here is the conclusion he comes to is that right now, it seems like we'll never perfectly know every single part of this, just given the fact that there is so much of a literal wall in front of that information. So moving forward, we get into the conversation around what this means for gain of function research, how the US should cooperate if China it comes to viral research. So many really big things here, and I was happy we could do it in a smart way. Lots of great stuff. Once again, quick show notes here. Book show. So go to our bookshop link to check out Viral and any other books. Number two, Soccer and I love doing our books of the year. So what we're going to do is take the next week to actually put the books out that will send out the Substack and everything else you all will enjoy as well too. And also, this is a quick request for submission. Send emails of books that you all really thought you enjoyed, especially books that Realignment guests put out there too. So send those emails into realignmentpod at gmo.com. Last but not least, Substack is going out today. So go check that out as well too in the show notes, of course. Finally, huge thank you to Lincoln Network for supporting our work. Let's get into the episode. Matt Ridley, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me on the show. Before we get into the investigatory part of this episode, listening to the audiobook version of your book, which is really enjoyable, I really recommend it as well for folks, you all wrote something that really was interesting, which is basically that the 20th century in many respects is a story of humanity gradually, seemingly conquering various types of disease. So two questions come from that as relate to COVID. One, could you just tell that story of the 20th century? And two, when it comes to these various diseases that we immediately think of, whether it's the Black Death hundreds and hundreds of years ago or more recent diseases, how did ascertaining their origins play a role in that conquest? Right. Well, um, uh, the a lot of humanity up until 100 or 120 years ago was infectious disease was a huge killer, particularly of children, but also of old people, um, and sometimes of uh, people in their prime, like when plagues happen. So there was plague, there was measles, there was smallpox, uh, there were all the waterborne diseases like typhoid and cholera, um, there were insect-borne diseases like malaria and yellow fever and so on. Um, uh, and uh, then there would be respiratory outbreaks like influenza and, and, and things like that. And if you look at you know, the 
effect of these on humanity. They, they produce lethal outcomes for huge numbers of people. And then beginning with the very first vaccinations against smallpox in the 18th century, um, and then particularly the development of clean water in the early 20th century, um, and other vaccines like for whooping cough and polio and measles and um, these other diseases. Um, by the time someone like me is born in the 19, end of the 1950s, the chances are in a Western country and increasingly actually even uh, in the rest of the world, you are not going to face a lethal infectious disease. And that's the first time in the history of humanity. By 1976, we've effectively driven smallpox extinct. That's an, ex 77, I think it was. That's an extraordinary achievement. We've actually wiped out an entire disease. By the early 2000s, we're hoping to do the same for polio. It very, very nearly happened, and then it just did quite, didn't quite happen. Um, uh, there are still a few cases of polio uh, around. Um, but other diseases are now vanishingly rare, and there's a chance of, of actually getting rid of some of them. So this is a, a very, very successful story. You know, we shouldn't forget just how spectacular those achievements are. Even malaria, which was getting worse in the 1990s, has now entered a steep decline. Even HIV, which was a brand new disease in the 1980s, um, is now very much a survivable disease and is, is declining rapidly as a, as, a, as a cause of death. So you asked a very good question, though. Did we need to know where these viruses came from to defeat them? And the answer is no. We didn't know where smallpox came from. We didn't know where polio came from uh, in terms of when they first entered the human species and how. Um, we've since, but that's because we didn't have genomic knowledge. You know, without genomic knowledge, we, we've we've we, we weren't able to understand these things. We now know that, you know, the closest relative of tuberculosis is found in cattle. Um, uh, measles, I think, also comes from cattle uh, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, so we can, we can sort of trace where we picked up these diseases from. In the case of plague, it was important to realise that people were catching it from fleas, which were catching it from rats. Um, uh, and, and, and so understanding the method of transmission was important, but understanding the origin wasn't. And there was a big debate about the origin of AIDS, um, the origin of HIV. It turned out that it's rampant in uh, chimpanzees in Central Africa, but they may have picked it up from somebody else. In the case of Ebola, we wanted to know which species did we get this from. It turned out to be bats. In the case of SARS, bats. In the case of MERS, bats. In the case of NIPA, which is a nasty disease in South, South Asia, breaks out occasionally, bats again. So um, there is, there's been a rash of diseases picked up from bats by human beings in the last uh, 50 years. Um, rabies also comes from bats. Marburg is another one. Uh, and that's because there are so many species of bats they live in dense colonies, a bit like we do. You know, they're, they're, their roosts are like cities in a sense. Uh, so they are kind of designed to spread these respiratory infections. They have rather different immune systems from us. Um, and maybe we're coming into contact with them more, although I'm not convinced about that because as, as an archaeologist pointed out to me, um, prehistoric human beings spend an awful lot of time in caves. So they would have had a lot of encounters with bats in, in the distant past. Um, so we know this virus is a bat virus. The, the virus causing SARS-CoV-2 is a bat virus. It came from horseshoe bats, nowhere else. We know that. We knew that before, really before the pandemic started because of all the work on the other SARS-like viruses. The question we set out to understand in this book is how did it get from bats to people? And one other follow-up here I'm curious about the role of why is it that disease you reference this with conspiracies around HIV AIDS obviously during the 1300s you had deeply anti-semitic beliefs around the spread of plague what is it about any type of disease good faith or not that really even in the modern age brings just brings to mind conspiracy 
Um, the more and more we've understand about these processes, as you said, like we understand genomics a lot more. What is it about this specific area of science, which tends to just consistently across ages, just bring back to these themes and even these debates that are in many ways infecting the exploration you're doing? Right. Well, there's, there's, a, um, uh, there's a tendency in human beings to assume that when something happens, somebody caused it to happen. You know, we don't tend to think, oh, that's just bad luck. Uh, we say this is God punishing us or the Jews started it. You know, that was quite a common thing in, in plague-ridden countries in, in, in Europe. Um, so there is, a, there is an inherent human tendency to try and lash out and blame someone when, a, when an epidemic or a, or a pandemic happens. And one has to be careful not to do that and not to fall into that trap. And yes, there are cases of biological warfare in human history. You know, I mean, there was a siege in the 1300s in the Crimea and the Mongols, I think it was, um, deliberately uh, threw infected corpses with catapults into the city so as to infect the people in there. And there are stories about early settlers in the Americas uh, giving blankets to Indians that they know would give them smallpox. I don't know how, how much evidence there is for these kinds of stories, but, you know, the stories are out there of deliberately infecting your enemy with the disease. Um, so it, it, it both does happen in some sense, but not very often, and it often gets blamed wrongly for, for how a disease starts. Um, uh, and in the case of covid we started, everybody started, with the assumption this was likely to be an accidental event. So, you know, that's a much more mature way of approaching it, saying, look, this is probably because some wildlife trader has brought an animal to a market that has picked up a virus from a bat and given it to people. That's what happened in the case of SARS, and we found that out very quickly in a couple of months. That's not quite what happened in the case of MERS, where camels got infected by bats and then camels infected people. But it wasn't because of camels being fed. It was because of camels being, you know, um, looked after. And again, very quickly found out where the link came from. The puzzle in this case was that after two years, we still don't have a clear chain of infection of early people and what they were up to in markets or, or what they were doing elsewhere. And the, for the first time in history, we've also got to take into account a serious alternative possibility, which is that in the last 20 years, a research program has developed to study SARS-like viruses in laboratories on an immense scale and do a lot of experiments with them. And those uh, experiments have been largely done in the city of Wuhan, which is where this outbreak happened. Uh, and so that does behove us to take this seriously. We know that viruses leak out of labs. We've got lots of histories of this happening. Most of them have not caused pandemics, uh, but local incidents. So smallpox has, has infected people in laboratories on numerous occasions, uh, anthrax, um, uh, SARS, in at least four times in 2003-04, SARS was being studied in laboratories and laboratory workers got infected. And on three of those occasions, we don't know how it happened. So we have to take seriously the possibility that um, this virus was being studied in the laboratory and someone caught it there, or it was being collected in the wild from bats and somebody caught it in the bat cave. Um, and that's where we start, really, with that hypothesis up against the hypothesis of uh, a food-related um, market event. And that's a really useful framing. So let's just start here then. There are a variety of different actors here, the Chinese government, the US government, international organizations like WHO, decentralized investigators such um, as yourself. How, what facts, quote unquote, given the timeline, do all of these different actors agree on? And then we'll get into where things start to diverge. Yeah, that's a really good, good way of framing it. Um, what everybody agrees on is that it started in Wuhan. I don't think anybody uh, seriously, I mean, uh, seriously thinks it reached Wuhan 
from an outbreak somewhere else. I mean, an individual might have come with an infection from somewhere else, but but there was no outbreak before Wuhan. Um, secondly, I think we can all agree that it happened in late 2019. The first cases were detected in December. Some retrospective diagnosis uh, identified cases in late November, but that's not certain. The family tree of the various strains of the virus converge on a date of mid-November. That Everybody feels that feels about right. Some people say there may be evidence of infections in October, possibly even September, that seems to me unlikely, because if that had happened, there'd have been far more cases by December. So we've got an outbreak in one city, first noticed in December, and first thought to be associated with a particular market, the Huainan seafood market, um, which uh, was where a lot of the early cases had spent time. But not all of them. And it was only one strain we now know that was in the market. So here's where the disagreements begin. We can start to say, was that um, where it began or was that just an early super spreader event, an amplifying event? That's, you know, where we're beginning to start to lose the consensus. So there's really not a very big number of things we can all, um, well, I mean, there's lots of other things that everybody can agree on, that it's a coronavirus, that it's a SARS-like coronavirus, that it's a so-called Sarbico virus, um, which is a particular type of, of these viruses, that it's related to SARS but not derived from SARS, that we haven't found a wild relative that could have started the pandemic. That is to say, we found some very close relatives, 96 97%, but that's not good enough. In the case of SARS, we found 99% plus uh, relatives in some animals. We, The 99% cousin of SARS-CoV-2 is one of the great missing features of this. And something I'm wondering about here is, explain the, the, the project that you and your co-author focused on explain explain the actual project because what's interesting here is once again you've discussed this on other pro, on other podcasts but this is a really decentralized approach to examining all these questions i'm not going to ask you the direct question okay tell me literally what happened because that isn't something that we're capable of determining right now so the way this project is coming about from my perspective is a response to a uniquely non-transparent state of affairs when it comes to these things. So could you just explain your project? And then at a more quasi-philosophical level, can you explain to what degree can governments, institutions, et cetera, to what degree are they resistant to decentralized approaches such as yourselves? You know, you think of the the internet cliche of information wants to be free, everything that's a secret will eventually come out. How much, I mean, this this, COVID is definitely testing that idea. But I'm just curious how you think of this as someone who's obviously, I think, paving the way for how groups are going to approach these questions moving forward. Well, exactly. I think, uh, you know, for me, the fascination for this has been the fact that as, um, uh, you know, non-professional, unpaid people doing this in our spare time, Alina Chan and I have been able to put together a book that without solving the problem, takes the reader through all the evidence that can be assembled. And a lot of that evidence comes from unpaid people doing things in their spare time. And for me, that's been one of the fascinating parts of this project, that finding out where SARS-CoV-2 came from is a really important issue. We need to know to prevent the next pandemic, if nothing else. And Yet, we have not been able to rely on government actors, you know, Western governments, Chinese governments, to give us sufficient information to solve that problem. Nor have we been able to rely on mainstream media on the whole, with some very honourable exceptions. Uh, they've shown surprisingly little curiosity about this topic, frankly. Um, nor has the scientific establishment been much help again with some honourable exceptions. Quite a lot of them take the view that we'd rather not find out um, because it might lead to a row. 
or it might buttress one polit- pol- political uh, argument or something like that. So, so the people we've come to rely on in this situation, to some extent, are the people who have dug out vital pieces of information that might not otherwise have come out. And they've been able to do that because of the existence of the internet and because of social media on which they communicated. That we couldn't have done this book in this way 20 years ago because there wasn't Twitter and there wasn't people um, sitting in one country but digging out a thesis in another country that is hidden away but not secret and which has a vital piece of information in it. So specifically, I'm referring to the work, for example, of Rosana Segreto in Uh, Well, she now lives in Norway, but she's Italian. Um, uh, The Seeker, who's an Indian uh, living in India, but who found, uh, Rosana Segreto found a very important fact, which is that two different viruses with different names were actually the same virus. Um, And uh, this was simply a renaming of of an existing virus. And that was, until we knew that, we hadn't connected this very close relative of SARS-CoV-2 with an outbreak in which people died, which was investigated by the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, in 2012. What the speaker found was that there was a thesis in uh, Kunming in China, which described the treatment of those patients in 2012 in great detail and showed that the doctors treating them were sure they'd caught a SARS-like virus after shoveling bat guano in a particular in an abandoned mine shaft. And therefore the, the focus on this mine shaft became very important, which was where it turned out they had found this close relative of SARS-CoV-2 a year later, and then eight more two years after that. So which is why the nine closest relative to SARS-CoV-2 when the pandemic began were sitting in a freezer in the city of Wuhan. They'd been taken there from this mine shaft. 1,800 kilometers away by road. So all of this information comes out because of these open source analysts, internet sleuths, um, people who are, you know, they're not spies, uh, they're not journalists, they're just digging into um, uh, websites, getting hold of logins, finding out where theses are, where grant proposals are, where other documents are, um, Then there's another guy who finds out that there's a database at the Wuhan Institute of Virology with 22,000 entries in it, all about viruses, most of them connected with bats, um, which has gone offline before the pandemic and is still unavailable. And we're able to challenge the Wuhan Institute of Virology and say, why won't you make this available? No no good answer has come back yet. But the, the point you're making is that decentralized actors communicating with each other have played an incredibly important part in this. Citizen scientists, you could call them. And that hasn't gone down very well with established government paid scientists, frankly. And I think that's a pity. This is interesting because I would like you to tell, I'd like you to explain what you mean by this hasn't gone down by established scientists, because I was joking in my head as you said that. I'm like, well, like to be fair, there's a world where someone says that Alex Jones is a citizen scientist. That's obviously not what you're saying, but can you speak to the, what about the scientific community then? So, cause like, cause the Alex Jones debate is more of a debate for social media platforms and those bits, but it's interesting that you're saying specifically the scientific community has not been receptive to the dynamic you're describing. Can you give me more about that? I'm afraid I'm, I'm uh, unsure who Alex Jones is. <laughs> oh, he's uh, he basically he's a. <laughs> this is funny. Explain something in five seconds or less. He's a he's a prominent American social media personality who's been banned from multiple platforms for spreading not just like fake dis like but actual un deep 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 untruths uh, related to science, gun deaths, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Well, there are people who we thought were reliable who proved not to be. Uh, you know, whose information we couldn't trust after a while. Um, But there are others who have been 
uh, just got better and better the more we've understood them. So there's a guy called Francisco Ribera who's in Madrid, and this is his real name, by the way. He just tried to be anonymous, and he um, is a technology consultant, and he got interested in this question. Uh, he learned to understand uh, molecular biological information very quickly, um, and he started trying to assemble a list of all the virus samples collected from bats by the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, and he was gleaning bits of information from published papers, from theses, from grant applications, et cetera, et cetera. And after a bit, he was able to put the serial numbers that they had attached to virus samples in uh, order and work out which cave each group of serial numbers had come from uh, and thereby identify other viruses that had come from this mine shaft where these close relatives of SARS-CoV-2 had been found. And eventually he said, hang on, there are eight very closely related viruses to the pandemic that were collected in 2015 that we'd like to know more about. Uh, could you please tell us more information? Well, six months later, the Wuhan Institute of Virology rather sort of shamefacedly admitted, yes, there are eight other viruses that we collected. Uh, we haven't sequenced them. We might get around to it. Not really good enough. But, you know, a lot of these, so, you know, these guys are doing really good work, and yet they are criticised for being amateurs, for not having the qualifications. Ribera doesn't have a molecular biology degree, nor does Baba Elephant, another key uh, person here, but he's, a, he's an expert on cladistics now. You know, he's taught himself. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a real credentialism debate goes on. How dare you talk about this? You're, we, we keep getting told, well, you're not an epidemiologist. How can you write a book about this? Well, sorry, I don't think that science is a priesthood. I don't think it's something that you, you know, you have to be qualified before you're allowed to contribute. You you learn the subject, you get into it, you make a few mistakes, and then you contribute. And uh, uh, the, the, the degree to which we've come up against a sort of haughty and arrogant disapproval of anyone who makes a... A contribution here is really quite striking. I'll give you a good example just from very recently. The Eco Health Alliance, which is a scientific group uh, funded by the American government uh, and which does a lot of funding of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, uh, put out a tweet saying that I was wrong to say that they had ever collected viruses in Laos uh, and sent them to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, and so I replied to that tweet. Well, here is one example out of about 120 of a entry in a genetic database describing a virus that was collected in Laos by the EcoHealth Alliance and was and is now housed at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. What am I missing here? Why are you saying that's that doesn't exist when I'm saying here's the evidence? Three and a half weeks have now gone by and they won't respond to my tweet. Now, um, that's not acceptable. They're being funded by taxpayers to do work on these viruses. I'm, I'm saying, please, will you explain how these viruses collected in Laos ended up at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and they won't give me any information. I just don't think that's good enough. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly I've caught them out in... Uh, uh, saying something that's wrong and they don't like it. But that's, uh, you know, so they've left their tweet up there that accuses me of being wrong and it wrongly accuses me of being wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it is a case of um, the scientific establishment cannot say, don't worry your pretty little heads with this, ordinary people. We've got it under control. We know what we're doing in a case where five to 10 million people have died. You know, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. You make all your data available, you enable ordinary people to discuss it and to get sufficiently expert through self-education that they can discuss it. And then we can have a conversation. 
this is really interesting because I, I really, particular reason I really wanted to speak with you about this topic is the juxtaposition of who you are, your career, and this project. This is, you're wearing you're wearing a suit and tie right now. You're recording this from Parliament, so in many ways you you are not just metaphorically, literally in a pillar of quote unquote the establishment. Yet when I hear your articulation of what's happening in the scientific community, it seems to me the problem is they haven't adjusted to a world where what they say effectively doesn't matter. So if it's pre-internet and the only way you can get published or the only way you could distribute yourself is through purely credentialist institutions, obviously, for good or for ill, all of the power is there. But moving forward, that just simply isn't true. And this could be a good thing. This could be a bad thing. But I'm curious how you think as a the person wearing the tie here, how do you think established institutions can handle this dynamic moving forward? How should, how should they approach this? Because it's not just, because it's not just asking them to be humble, because I think it's actually not just arrogance. I actually don't think they conceptually understand the quote unquote shift that's happened here in the sense that this is going from the world of the Catholic church to the Gutenberg Bible, um, printing press, it's that type of shift. So how, how do you suggest people in your position conceptualize this? Exactly. Well, you're dead right. I'm as big a pillar of the establishment as you can think of. I'm you know, a member of the House of Lords. But, but the beauty of the House of Lords is that we're unpaid. Um, we can do what we like, basically. Uh, I'm not employed by any institution and sort of never have been. I've been a commentator on science uh, for a very long time. Well, not never have been, but you know, since a long time ago, I've been... Uh, an, an independent commentator on science. I've written books about genomics, about um, evolution. Uh, I'm very interested in all these topics. But I come at it with zero vested interest uh, in the sense that I am not here to defend one institution or another. I'm here to get at the truth. I mean, of course, we've all got one or two vested interests, etc. you know, that, that crop up from time to time. But... Uh, the 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 the, the you you're dead right that the the scientific establishment could say these are the people we allow through the door these are the people we allow to discuss it these are the people we allow to publish um and the rest of you i'm afraid are just going to have to take it on trust from us and that has broken down people can now interrogate the data people can now publish on stuff online they can publish preprints um they can uh, they can criticize uh, the, the work of professional scientists, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very uncomfortable moment for people in professional scientific disciplines. And by the way, I come at this, at this as someone who is, uh, you know, very much in favor of science, you know, of the philosophy of experiment and hypothesis and deduction and reasoning and a, a uh, you know, I'm a fierce critic of pseudoscience, of, of people who, um, you know, put wacky ideas out and don't support them properly and don't support them with experiments. So it's not as if I'm coming and saying, um, uh, you know, anything goes. We can now, uh, you know, the, the guy who says the moon is made of cheese is just as valid as the man who says it's made of rock. Um, I, I don't think that. But I do think that there is a democratization of science happening, which is, uh, which, uh, you know, for example, the scientific journals have yet to adjust to. I mean, scientific journals, to me, have, have behaved quite poorly during this pandemic because they have pushed out some really rather tendentious and opinionated pieces, pretending they were um, definitive scientific papers about. The, the, the question of the origin of the virus, particularly in The Lancet in February and in Nature Medicine in March. Um, these were poorly argued papers without much data that came to strong conclusions about the origin of the virus. And then they, they have sat on and delayed the publication of important papers that didn't fit that paradigm. So, for example, um, uh, the... the, the well, in February, there was a rush of four papers came out, 
saying, oh, look, pangolins have got SARS like coronaviruses closely related to SARS CoV 2. That's really interesting. Maybe that's how people picked it up. Well, those papers were barely worth the paper they were written on. They pretended to deal with four different sets of pangolin papers. In fact, they dealt with one, uh, sorry, of pangolins. In fact, they dealt with the, all dealt with the same data, uh, but rehashed it in different ways. That data had already been published the year before. The similarity to the virus wasn't as close as had been announced in the press release before the papers came out. The data was insufficient and patchy and didn't make sense. When my co-author pointed out a lot of this, it took something like a year and a half before the journals added lengthy explanations of how uh, these papers could not be trusted in their original form. So there's a, there's a, a fast publication of stuff that suits the scientific establishment and a foot dragging of stuff that doesn't. And I don't like that. Now, you may say I'm a, you know, an establishment figure, but I'm an establishment figure who quite likes being a bit independent here um, and coming at it from the point of view the only thing that I care about is the truth, um, not uh, what effect this has on someone's reputation or someone's uh, relationship with other countries or whatever. You know, it's interesting. As you articulate this, I'm realizing the dynamic here if you're someone running a journal, because I'm trying to be empathetic here, when you're challenged by a democratization of a space where in many ways your entire job was serving as a gatekeeper, once again, by necessity, if it's the 1960s, you, you literally had to be a gatekeeper because information had to be spread. There's only so many pages in the journal. Someone's not getting in. Credentials are a very actually useful way to sort through all that. But as you're challenged by democratization, you are going to cling to that thing you had before even more. So what I'm wondering from you then is, because the, the one quick pit, and this is, you haven't said this, but I think this happens too often from folks who are sympathetic to the more skeptical point of view. They act as if the journals don't matter or if the establishment doesn't matter. I think, I think there's a mix. I think the story of COVID is that there's 20 different things, none of who could say that other one can't exist anymore. What, what, what role does, what, what role should we, how should we treat credentials? Moving, moving, moving forward. So, for example, you, you have a co-author who is very, very, very credentialed. So, how, how how should we think of that as just consumers of news and information? Um, yeah. Well, I, I I think you know credentials do matter. You know, if if somebody says something important about the virus, uh, one of the first thing I want to check is who is this guy? Uh, does he know what he's talking about? But there are different kinds of credentials. There's you know professor of virology or epidemiology, fine, that's important. But is he a professor of virology where that means he's got a bit of a vested interest in the way things have been done before and his whole grant um, program is threatened if we find that actually laboratories like his have been causing dangerous problems? You know, so to some extent credentials point you to um, conflicts of interest. Or do you look at credentials in a slightly different way? So Yuri Dagin is a... Um, Russian biotech entrepreneur who uh, is making significant contributions in this field and having vigorous arguments with professional scientists. Now, Dagin's background is uh, um, not in the biological sciences, but he then worked for pharmaceutical industry and he then set up his own biotech company. And the credential he has is that if you're doing biotechnology in the area of uh, combating aging, you're going to meet a lot of snake oil salesmen. Mm -hmm. And you learn to be good at saying who's uh, making useful contributions and who isn't. So the credential in question is an ability to handle and access and challenge information. And I think it's very important to, 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 to find people who are prepared to, to ask tough questions uh, about data, whatever their original degree. And it's very noticeable that a lot of, the, a lot of the, the running on trying to understand what was happening in these laboratories, particularly in Wuhan, has come from people outside the field of virology 
but who are good at challenging and digging and finding out information. And we're all on a steep learning curve. You know, uh, none of us, uh, I don't think I knew the phrase fear in cleavage site um, before this began, uh, but I do now understand it. I understand why experiments have been done with it in the past. I understand the, 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 the significance of it as, as a feature that appears in SARS-CoV-2 and no other SARS-like coronavirus. But I don't like it when a, a professor of biology says, oh, you don't understand that. Fearing cleavage sites can happen in lots of uh, other viruses. And I say, yes, but not SARS-like coronaviruses. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that. Do you see what I mean? You know, so <laughs> yes. your credentials are only, your credentials are only, they only get you through the door and even then, you mustn't rely on them. Uh, you know, people say, how could Alina Chan and Matt Ridley have written a book about the origin of the virus? They haven't got a degree in epidemiology between them. Well, if that's your only argument against our book, I don't think it's a very strong one. It's an argument. It's And, and once again, this is where I'm trying to offer free advice to people who are attempting to serve these functions. That is not an argument which is going to hold particular water moving forward, whether you like that effect or not. So the question is, so for example, I, I do not think that it's at all effective rhetorically for Dr. Fauci to say, I am the representative of science. Whether or not that is true, that is not an argument that convinces the critics that you're actually doing with. So people have to ask themselves, how am I communicating? That's why we're spending so much time here, because I think it's I think it's deeply important. Going back to the investigation, just, I started- just, I, Oh yeah, I, please. Sorry, no, I just going to just bring in Richard Feynman here because, you know, on that challenger in, uh, inquiry, he is someone who doesn't, he, he's not an engineer. He hasn't designed rockets. Sorry, who is he? More context. Uh, Richard Feynman was a, was a physics professor at Caltech, brilliant guy, Nobel Prize winner, etc. cetera. But he, he was put on the inquiry into what happened to the Challenger space shuttle. And he asked for a glass of iced water and he put a sample of the rubber O-ring in it and showed that it, when it was cooled down, it was less uh, elastic than when it was warm. And that was a key moment in that inquiry. Now, he did a little experiment live on television, as it were, during the inquiry. His, I mean, he, he's one of the great sort of philosophers of science. And his great line was, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Now, what is he saying by that? It's quite provocative. What he's saying is that in the end, in, if, if you're doing science properly, the judge of whether you're right or wrong is the evidence. It's not the professor. <laughs> it's not who says it's right. It's the data. That's the ultimate arbiter whether you're right or wrong. Does the data support your hypothesis or not? Not how many Nobel Prizes have you got? How many um, professorships have you got? That doesn't matter one jot. What matters is the evidence. And what's useful about that is that is a rhetorical articulation of his role and the process that he's participating in, which functions in a low trust society. Um, this is the broad story of most of the Western world, low trust in institutions, um, low trust in general, a lot of skepticism. That is a framework, which is really important. I, I want to go back to the, to the actual investigation. We started off by asking, you know, what does everyone agree on? There's only so much that you and Alana could come to, couldn't to agree on, but what can we, what can we write off? Is there anything that we, per your investigation, what common stories would an audience interested in this topic? What what is something I've probably heard that you just think? No, that's just not it, if at all. Well, in one sense, you can write off, you know, the idea that the five G telephone network caused this virus, or there is no virus, all those kind of stuff. But slightly more realistically. We think you can pretty well definitely write off the idea that this was a deliberate release of a bioweapon or indeed was an accidental release of a bioweapon. Um, the research that was being done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was ostensibly trying to understand, predict, and prevent pandemics. Okay, 
not to start a biological war. And I think that that's true. I, you know, I've seen no evidence to suggest that even if maybe the military was involved in this work in some way, that it was anything other than defensive, anything other than um, uh, what it said on the tin, which was let's try and understand where SARS came from, where the next SARS-like virus might come from. Uh, so uh, the people who say this was an attempt to make a vaccine which went wrong, or this was an attempt to make a, a weapon which went wrong, we don't have any time for that. We can't find any evidence to support that, and we think this, that it's highly unlikely. If you were going to do that, you wouldn't do it in Wuhan, you'd do it in a remote area, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, it's a terrible bioweapon. It's not a very, you know, it doesn't kill enough people for a start, uh, you know, et cetera. Could you explain the, can you explain like what a bio, like what, like explain what a bioweapon is actually? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, particularly in the Soviet Union, there were programs to um, develop virulent strains of bacteria or viruses that could then be sprayed over enemy armies and make them all sick or dead. Uh, anthrax was used uh, in experiments of this kind. And there was a leak of anthrax in the city of Sverdlovsk, now Ekaterinburg, in Russia in 1979, which killed 80 people. And it leaked from a factory which was making which was studying um, how to make these things into an offensive weapon that could actually be used to, to kill people in enemy countries. You know, so this did happen and does happen. Um, uh, but most work that happens in biological warfare labs, like Fort Detrick in the US or Porton Down in the UK, is defensive. That is to say, they're not trying to design something to kill enemy soldiers with. They're trying to understand what they might have to defend against um, if a terrorist or an enemy starts trying to wage biological warfare uh, on them. Uh, and the Chinese are much the same. You know, the Chinese authorities were doing biological warfare research, but as far as we can tell, it was defensive, not offensive. And that takes us, because you referenced this earlier, you, you said that the processes that we understand were happening at the Wuhan lab were part of this 20-year project to once again engage in this defensive research. Can you, can you, just, can you give us just the 20-year the framework for what was happening, your assessment of the work? I think this is where this area gets muddled just in terms of like, how is the U.S. government funding this type of resource through a third party, research through a third party, is this research too dangerous to go forth with? But to your point earlier, it's 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 defensive. So it's it's kind of, a, is, it, is it safer to not engage in research, but is it actually more dangerous to not engage in research? Just just help me understand this part. Yeah, of it. yeah. Well, a lot of it begins with the SARS epidemic of 20, 2002, 2003. Um, in the wake of that, it became clear that people had got infected from animals in markets, but it quickly became apparent that the natural reservoir of the virus wasn't these animals, but was horseshoe bats. And so the search began for the um, to find the virus living in wild horseshoe bats, um, the, the actual, the closest relative of, of SARS-CoV-2, because these kind of viruses were being found in bats in Hong Kong in particular to start with. And eventually that search took scientists from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was a long distinguished um, uh, laboratory, uh, but they became involved in this work and took them to uh, further west into Yunnan, where they found uh, in a series of caves in the mountains, uh, large colonies of horseshoe bats, some of which were carrying very closely related viruses to SARS. And that's probably where SARS came from. And what they then did was brought these viruses back to the laboratory to sequence their genomes, which was then quite a new thing to be able to do, by the way. It's now routine. Uh, and then to mix and match them. And what the purpose of that was, was to say, with each newly found coronavirus, we want to take its spike gene and put in one of the ones that, we've already that we already know how to grow in the the lab. It's not very easy to get these things to grow in the lab on, on, on in cell culture. But you know, we they got one called WIV1 that they 
grew in the, the lab. And we'll insert into its genome each of these new uh, spike genes from each of these new viruses as we find them. And we'll then be able to test them and we'll find out which of them are ready to infect human beings. And we'll then say, whoa, the virus we found last year could cause a pandemic. It can, it's capable of infecting human beings. So that was the purpose of that research. But along the way, they started finding that sometimes putting this new a new spike gene into one of their existing strains of coronavirus resulted in a new strain that was several orders of magnitude more infectious or more lethal to mice. And these are mice with humanized genes in them, human, humanized mice, that is to say. Um, uh, and effectively, if you're doing that, you're, light, you're playing with a lighted match uh, looking for a gas leak. You know, you are, you, are, you are saying to a virus, oh, here's some human cells in a mouse or, or, or in a tissue sample that you can infect, and you can get good at infecting them, and we're going to help you get good at infecting them, and we're only doing this at biosecurity level two, or in the case of the mice experiments, three, which is not good enough, particularly biosecurity level two. That's basically just wearing gloves and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the chances of infecting a researcher when you're doing this are really quite high now because you're dealing with viruses that are getting better and better at infecting human cells and are more and more infectious or more and more lethal. Um, this is gain-of-function research. It was going on. Why are you doing it? Well, sort of because you can, <laughs> um, you get carried away with the, you know, what else can we do? What, you know, how else can we manipulate these things? Wouldn't it be? And then we can get a paper in Nature talking about this. But also because you perhaps want to, you know, really get the Nobel Prize for catching a virus that's in the act of starting a pandemic and stopping it. Wouldn't that be rather a wonderful thing to, to, to be able to claim that you've done? Um, now, as you, as you suggested, quite a lot of this work was encouraged, funded, and collaborated with from the United States. The EcoHealth Alliance is a uh, private foundation based in New York City um, that has been getting $17 million a year or so recently from the uh, US government, a lot of money, uh, and spending it mostly in other countries to help with this so-called pandemic preparedness research. And a lot of this work has gone on field work, collecting bats and sampling them in caves. But a lot of it has also gone on laboratory experiments, including particularly at Wuhan. They had a very close relationship with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They were very good friends with them. They worked very closely with them. And uh, so these weren't the only funders of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Be clear about that. Most of its money was coming from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So, um, but a lot of the know-how being developed in American universities was then shared with the Wuhan Institute of Virology about how to manipulate coronaviruses in the laboratory. Um, so there is a clear flow of American money that supports this, American know-how that supports this in particular. Now, what Dr. Fauci and others get into a slightly semantic argument about is whether this did or didn't break the US rules on gain of function. But if you ask the simple question, were experiments done on SARS-like coronaviruses that made them more dangerous to human beings? The answer is undoubtedly yes, okay? Now, did it make them dangerous enough to start a pandemic? We don't know. Did they involve this particular strain of SARS-like coronavirus? As far as we can tell so far, no. In other words, we cannot find evidence of an experiment with this particular SARS-CoV-2-like virus. But are there viruses collected that we don't know about? Yes. We know about almost none of the viruses that have been used in these experiments since 2016. 
We know about the work up to 2015 and part of 2016, and then nothing after that. So are there other viruses that were being worked on but had not yet been published? Yes. Was one of them SARS-CoV-2 or very like it? We don't know. So, so what's your position or at least your perception of the future for this sort of research? Because hearing what you're saying, Tabula Raza, my reaction is basically – if it's done, it has to be done in situations where there's complete, utter transparency, where we don't have to speculate, where we don't say we don't know. That, that, that's just my generic reaction on the spot, but I'm curious how you think about it. Yes, I mean, I think this is an enormous warning uh, bell for this kind of research. I was shocked that this kind of thing was going on, frankly. Uh, I knew that people were experimenting with viruses. I hadn't realized just how far they'd gone in terms of gain of function. Um, I was aware there'd been a debate five or six years ago about doing gain-of-function experiments with influenza viruses. Most uh, of it has been done very responsibly, this work, um, but still, it is clearly a risky thing to have been doing. And whether this pandemic began as a result of that research or not, I will certainly be campaigning um, for, as you say, greater transparency. It seems to me utterly shocking that you can have a um, a series of experiments going on uh, and not tell the world about them. Um, if it's secret biological warfare research, well, then it shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, and if it's with the intention of helping the world, then it should be in the public domain. And that's not just when you get around to publishing it five years later. That's, you know, now the pandemic has started, we're going to tell you. So I want a, a treaty that countries agree to sign, saying we will be transparent about this kind of research. But I also want a moratorium on some of the more dangerous experiments. Uh, I don't see that there is sufficient justification for making already dangerous viruses much more dangerous, much more likely to infect human beings or much more likely to kill them. Uh, it doesn't feel that that is worth doing. The, the benefits of such a research in terms of predicting which viruses are going to cause the next pandemic seem to me pretty illusory compared with the risks that they might cause it themselves. And I guess here's something I'm wondering about, given what you just said. To what degree does predicting the next pandemic matter on the ground? So let me put it more clearly there's all these different, you know, there, there are emergency preparedness plans in the White House. There's all these, there's, there's several writers who look very, and they were smart, who look very smart from 2010 saying the next big threat given globalization and all these different trends is a pandemic. On the ground, it doesn't seem as if the predictions made any difference in the sense that the Chinese government was far too aggressive towards whistleblowers at the start. Um, the U.S. made a variety of very bad calls um, when it came to either just taking it seriously or, or masking or different parts of that. Supply chains were wrecked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just don't know what the predict what, – what, what is the good faith articulation of why the predictions would have made a difference given the scenario we faced the past two years or so? Yeah, well, about five years ago, um, th this program came under some criticism from fellow virologists – and they said, we don't think this aspect of the work makes sense. We think if you want to prepare for a pandemic, we should do so by improving vaccine uh, development, uh, speeding up vaccine approval, doing more research on, on vaccines, on antivirals, um, doing more surveillance of uh, human populations to see who's getting sick so that we get early alarm warnings. We don't think going out into caves in mountains in southern China, catching bats, handling them, um, taking samples from them, taking those samples back to labs in cities and studying them is going to help at all. Because even if by doing that you say, oh, look, we found something that could cause a pandemic, there's millions of viruses out there that could cause a pandemic. Um, you're very unlikely to have found the most dangerous candidate. Um, and if you are, are you really wise to have brought it to a city? Um, and so on. 
So they made that case long before the pandemic. And they were told, don't be ridiculous. This is really important work. And for me, that's an important, that's the case we should be making. The preparation for pandemics should involve the human species, not bats and other species. Leave the wildlife alone. Stay away from it. Don't sample it to death. And if you do, for God's sake, don't take it back to labs and juice up the viruses. But on the other hand, work hard on um, making us better at producing vaccines. You know, there was this initiative called the um, uh, Vaccine... Pre- uh, um, sorry, I can't remember what, what it's called, but it, it was about um, the Wellcome Trust and... Uh, uh, the Gates Foundation got together and said, we need to get better at making vaccines in a hurry in case there's a pandemic. That's great work. Let's do that. And by the way, we've learned how to make vaccines much faster during this pandemic. We've got new technology for doing it, the messenger RNA technology and so on. So that's good stuff. For me, that's more important than simply stamp collecting viruses and bringing them to cities and experimenting on them. Very well said and an excellent place to leave the episode. Matt, um, we'd love for you to shout the book out um, for our listeners and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an enjoyable conversation.